get inside just just three words more than enough yes you are yes you are God you're more than enough oh you are you are no matter what I'm going through you're more than enough Meet me where I am right now, cause you're more than enough, yeah. Yes, you are, yes, you are. Oh, yes, you are, yes, you are. Oh, yes, you are, yes, you are. Just sing Jira one time on the way out. Jira, you are enough. Yes, you are, yes, you are. Jaira, you are enough, and I will be content in every circumstance. I will be content in every circumstance. Say, I will be content no matter what I'm going through. Say, I will be. Give God a praise in this place. If you know He's more than enough, you ought to lift, lift up your voice and let Him know. I think you can do better than that. Come on, come on, come on. You're more than enough, God. You're more than enough. Hallelujah. More than enough. He's more than enough. He's not just enough, He's more than enough. More, more than enough. God bless you, team. God bless you. God bless you. Hey, what's up, Wade? Y'all can be seated. What's up? How y'all doing? Oh, my God. Whew. I ain't going to try and preach after the preacher. I'm just going to talk to y'all for a second. Oh, my God. I know I got a clock, but I feel like I'm, I just feel like I'm honestly walking on water, but I'm seeing these families that were up here and the faith that it takes to get baptized, the, the journey to get delivered and the journey to trust in God, all the folks that you saw that were up here, and I just feel like I'm walking on water right now. God. Oh. And I don't believe I'm going to be walking alone today. Ah, all right. All right, y'all playing. All right. <laughs> 
Listen, I want to welcome everybody. Thank you all for making me feel at home. Me and my beautiful wife, Kristen. Hey, baby. Hey. It's so good to be with y'all uh, at the way with you here on the building or watching online. Hey, what's up? It's so good to see y'all. Um, yo, we had an amazing time. If you weren't one of the married couples that were here or about to get married, if you were at the conference this week, listen, Friday and Saturday was bananas. It was so good. It was so good. If you missed it, sorry, but you can, you can register for next year because we want to see you there. And so excited about that. The marriage conference was together in this. And we're just so great, so grateful that the way would allow us uh, to make deposits into the legacy of your church, into your DNA. And you said it, Pastor, this is more than a weekend. This is a relationship movement. Y'all got us now. You got us now. <laughs> Praise God. So I want to honor you, Pastor, Pastor Marco and Pastor Lisa. Can you give them a round of applause? Come on, from your heart. I love what they do. They're so, they serve so well. Oh, you can do better than that. I know you can do better than that. Amen. It's leadership. Leading. God bless you. Leading through a pandemic. Leading is not an easy task, man. And so I'm a part of your extended way family now. We're your cousins from the south. We say y'all and stuff like that from Atlanta. And so since I'm here with your family, I just want to give you, before I go into the world, I want to give you just a glimpse of my family. Can I do that? And just let you see the Jordan family real quick. Just put up this photo. Now, this is a photo that was taken at, in April at my daughter Sydney's wedding. She just got married and she came off my payroll. I said, she came off my payroll. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, her uh, husband, Stephen, now. They have a blended family, a new grandson, Carden, right there. I got my son, Christopher, his wife, Catherine, my beautiful wife, Kristen, our nine-year-old lady bug, that's Samantha, 18-year-old Skyler, playing football at Alcorn State down in Mississippi. Got another son named Elijah, playing basketball, red-shirting at Illinois State. Uh, beautiful family. And I'll go to the next photo, and this is my, my heart right here, the, the grandbabies. If you go ahead and put the next photo up there for me, you got that photo? Come on, come on, bring it. I want to see him. There they go. Ooh. Cute. I know they're handsome. They're handsome, what they call them. This is Cruz right here. This is Cash Baby. Cash Baby is almost two. And an uh, interesting story about Cash. Cash, um, we call him Sinatra because he's got these striking blue eyes. And he's just an amazing little dude. And uh, Cash was born... In January of 2020, right as we were heading into the pandemic. So even going into the pandemic, we came into 2020 holding an arm full of cash. You see what I'm saying there? Amen. Praise God. And Kristen and I, we are too young and too fly to be grandma and grandpa. Love it if you are grandma and a grandpa. We are not grandma and grandpa. She's me, me, and I'm big papa. Because I love it when they call me Big Pop. Uh, some of y'all will get that on the way home. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. It's okay. Yeah, but if you go ahead and put the next picture up, we have an album. It is the soundtrack to marriage ministry, and we have a marriage ministry called Marriage Masterpiece. This is the album, Masterpiece, that undergirds that album. It's an R&B album from a man that loves Jesus and loves his wife and loves his kid, loves his church, loves his community. You need to get this album. If you don't buy music, I would love you to buy it. If you don't buy it, put it on your streaming platforms, your Apple Music, your Pandora, your Spotify. You can actually do it right now while you're scrolling on your phone and checking your fantasy football team stats or whatever. Just scroll over just real quick and find my face and go ahead and add that to your playlist. And then there's one more picture of our book. This is how we do it, making your marriage a masterpiece. Some of you got it this weekend. If you didn't, there may be some left. If you need to fight for one out in the lobby, fight fair. Uh, and if you don't do that, you can also get it digitally online by going to montelandkristen.com. All right. All right. So that's all the details right there. If you have your Bible with you or an electronic device on silent, just a few moments, we're going to be reading from Acts chapter one. Acts chapter 1, and, and I'm going to share with you today uh, some things about love, and I'm probably going to share it in a way that you've never heard love talked about before. And personally, as an R&B recording artist, I feel like I know a little something, something about love. Uh, uh, from the way that I've lived it, the way I've experienced it, the way I've witnessed some things first 
hand. And this message is particularly near and dear to my heart because it deals with something that I'm extremely passionate about in ministry and in life. So before I give you this weekend's title of this message, I, I want to share a real cool story with you. Back in 2019, I was invited to perform on the season finale of American Idol. It was really cool. I'm there with Katy Perry and Lionel Richie and, and uh, Luke Bryan and all them people. And it was an amazing opportunity. And what's crazy is all behind the scenes, you know, on the, the staging and stuff between the tapings and all that. Um, I noticed uh, that on a keyboard out on the main stage is a copy of our marriage book just sitting out there on the keyboard. And I didn't put it there. So I'm like, okay, well, you know, what is this? So open conversation, start talking with the guy who's the music director. And he's like, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm like, well, that's awesome. You got a Christian out here, you know, putting in work on American Idol, but behind the scenes, he's like, yeah, he's like, I'm a Christian. And so I purchased a copy of your book to give to everybody on the set of American Idol. And I was like, wow, this was just like a crazy God moment. And he said, uh, he wanted to show people that he loved them and he was just giving them a gift. Now, here's, here's why I'm sharing this story with you. Um, this didn't take place in a church. Th this was taking place, a Holy Spirit moment was taking place on a Universal Studios parking lot back in trailers and back on these Hollywood sets. And uh, I just want you to understand this. Uh, God's business is always being handled in places you wouldn't expect Jesus to show up. <laughs> Word, listen, and I, I want to submit to you that if, if God is living inside of us, if, if God is living inside of you, that means everywhere we go potentially becomes holy ground. And so this weekend, we're going to talk about loving people to Jesus. Do you want a title? It's loving people to Jesus. Now, thank you for watching online as well. If you will, everybody, will you bow your heads and let's say a prayer. Heavenly Father, you've called us to be the salt of the earth. Reveal to us what that means so that we can love others to you. God, allow me to become invisible. So uh, what your sons and your daughters hear are your words. What they see is your truth. What they feel is your heart. Your heart pursuing us with a love so crazy and so intense that we have no option but to share it with others. God, we pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. 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 Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says this, but you will receive power. Somebody say power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. I want to take a moment. I want to talk about that word witness. And in order to talk about the word witness, I have to start by giving you the definition of the word evangelism. Evangelism. Evangelism, by definition, is the spreading of the Christian gospel by public preaching or personal witness. Now, real talk, y'all. I know evangelism can be a taboo word in some circles. I mean, some people see evangelism as the angry guy holding the street sign saying, turn or burn. Some people see evangelism as the big naked guy with the John 316 on his shirt, at, on, on, on his chest at the games. Some people see evangelism as uh, an unwelcome door to door visit from two people who didn't call first. Honestly, Modern day evangelism needs a makeover. And, and, and what I'm doing right now, what I'm doing right now is I'm evangelizing. I am public preaching and I'm spreading uh, the Christian gospel. And I need you to get this. The reality is not every Christian is gifted to be an evangelist, but every Christian is called to be a witness. How well are you doing at that? How are you doing with that, with being a witness of what God has done in your life? I want you to take a moment and literally just take inventory of, of how, what, listen, here's an indicator. If someone has ever said to you, oh, I didn't know you were a Christian, that's not a compliment. <laughs> that's an indictment. That's a compusult. A compliment and an insult. Listen, if you can't say amen, say ouch. Either, either one works. Listen, 
A witness doesn't make things up. A witness, they basically report what they've seen, what they've heard, and what's happened to them, what they've experienced. And you don't have to be a theologian to be a witness. Like, I can't explain Noah's Ark to y'all. I cannot explain how that family and them animals uh, escaped death. Don't know how it happened. But I am a witness to how when I was drowning in sin, God made a way for me to escape death. Amen. Listen, I can't explain how God split the Red Sea. I, I don't know. I, I don't know how he did it for all those people to walk through it. But I'm a witness that when it was impossible in front of me and improbable was behind me, that God came alongside of me and impressively brought me through on dry land. I feel like I'm preaching to somebody today. All I'm, I'm telling you what I've seen, what I've heard, and what I've experienced. I, I've, I have no idea how uh, the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro, I, I have no idea how they were thrown into a fiery furnace and God didn't let it burn. Shout out to Usher. God didn't let it burn, but... I am a witness that when my marriage and when my money and when my mind were going to hell in a handbasket, come on somebody, that God showed up and he brought us through the fire. Shout out to Shaka Khan. He brought us through the fire and we don't even smell like smoke. Ah, somebody ought to be one person that knows that God will give you beauty for ashes. Somebody ought to know. As a witness, all you're saying is, What you've seen, what you heard, and what you've experienced. Pastor, how do I do that? How do I use my witness to love people to Jesus? I'm so glad you asked. There are three ways, three ways that you can accomplish this. The first way to love people to Jesus by being a witness is to be reminded. Be reminded. In other words, remember. Remember what God delivered you from. I'll say it again. Remember what God delivered you from. God saved you from something to use you for something. Huh. And sometimes we as Christians get spiritual amnesia. Yeah, we get so saved and so complacent. We get so comfortable in church. We forget how we were when God found us. And if you don't remember, then you don't have a burden to go and tell somebody else. God placed a value in you, and that's why he placed you in the position he has you now because he sees you as priceless, and you have to be remembered. You have to remember what he delivered you from. The second way, second thing to remember is to remember how God sees you. You have to remember how God sees you. Listen, we always define who God is to us, we, how we see God. I see you as father. I see you as savior. Uh, uh, and sometimes, you know, I've heard the single women say, you know, Jesus is my husband. You see Jesus as your husband. And listen, we always define how we see him and we forget how he sees us. Can I remind you today how he sees you? He sees you as his son and as his daughter. Some of you don't even know that you're a son or a daughter. Some of you may be fatherless and you don't see yourself as a son or as a daughter, but I need you to know today, I need you to remember, to be reminded, before you are a husband or a wife, before you are a parent, before you are a whatever your title is, before you're even a man or a woman, you are a son and you are a daughter because that's how he sees you. Yeah, you gotta remember what he delivered you from. Remember how he sees you. And the third thing is remember who you represent. Remember who you represent. John chapter 13, verse 35 says this, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. Well, what is that this? That this is if you have love for one another, loving one another. Remember who you represent. Way, remember who you are representing him. We're so quick to represent our nation, our sports team, our hood, our nationality, our culture, and we don't always represent Jesus well. Amen? Listen, sometimes, sometimes, real talk, it's easier to love God than the people around us. (laughs) Yeah, but for some people, you will be the only representation of Jesus that they ever see. And for some of you, that should excite you. For some of you, that should terrify you. We're the representation that they get to see. And then we got to remember, we got to remember that he delivered us from something. We got to remember how he sees us and remember who we represent. The second way that we use our witness to love people to Jesus is to be near, 
be near. That means you got to have proximity. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt once said, uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Those are bars right there. Yeah, I want to give you a, a, another quick story. Um, uh, about two years ago, I performed a, an R&B concert, uh, and r- y'all don't know this, but uh, r- right in the middle of my shows, uh, as I'm performing, it's like, you know, you have, you know, Color Me Bad, they sing I Want to Sex You Up, and uh, it's, it's Salt and Pepper's coming next, but let's talk about sex, and, you know, it's the, you know, people are in the, they're in the 20,000, you know, they're in the arena, they got the, they drinks up, you know, it's a smell in the air that's not the Holy Spirit, y- 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 y'all picking up what I'm putting there, like, we, we had a concert, and, you know, and I come in there because promoters have wanted me to come into dark spaces and to bring some light because they know that I'm a pastor. And so now I come to these spaces where people don't normally expect Jesus to show up. And while the drinks are lifted and the weed smoke is in the air and people are in their space, I come out and I start in my songs. And in, in the middle, I share this with pastor. In the middle of a concert, I start talking to them about how I miss them and how God misses them and how God loves them and how God will send a 90s R&B singer into the middle of a concert to be there for them and to love on them and that God's not angry at them and God, and I'm, we're having church in the middle of a concert and it's the craziest thing when it happens and, and you don't get to see this, but here's what I wanted to do. I wanted to share just, I got one message from a, somebody that was at one of those concerts and they shared that with me and I want to share it with you today. Can I do that? All right, so check this out. This is, this is really cool. This is one of the responses uh, that I got and it says, it says this, um, my daughter and I were, were at your performance in Traverse City at the Cherry Festival. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that my 18-year-old daughter has no clue as to who you are. Okay. First of all, that's a parent fail. That's no bueno. That, that was, that's a parent fail right there, but it, it, gets, it gets better. Uh, she said, my daughter has no clue who you are. Uh, when you got done with your speech about being a pastor, she said to me, he's my new favorite person. He changed his lifestyle for the better. I don't know him, but I love him for that. She said, your speech gave her chills. She even teared up a bit. This was the first concert I have taken her to. It was a graduation present. She wanted to see Nelly. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. She wanted to see Nelly, but in the end, your speech was the highlight of her night. Keep doing what you're doing. You are leaving your mark on people all over the place. Also, this helps with the fact that now I have music that her and I both like. That's good. Amen. Come on, let's listen. listen. Congratulations, mommy. Thank you for that. Listen, the Bible said train up a child huh, in the way that they should go and it won't depart from it. And listen, if Jesus lives inside of you, every place your feet touch should become holy ground this is listen this is how witnessing works okay so so watch this as a friend what I just told you as a friend I came into a space and I shared what happens when God gets a hold of a man or a woman's heart and he transforms him that's all I did as a friend I shared what God had done in my life and then this woman Melissa and her daughter Haley they then hear that testimony and then so Melissa shares with me her testimony which is also her daughter's story and so now I've shared their story with you. Only thing I've done is I've shared what they saw, what they heard, and what they experienced. And now they are witnessing to you. Uh, Come on, you're missing this. Listen, God's love is so crazy. He would take and orchestrate a mom from somewhere in Michigan who's reaching hundreds and even thousands right now all over the world simply by saying what she saw, what she heard, and what she experienced. I approached her as a friend. She responded as a friend. And you can do that. You can do that. That's being near. That's proximity. You can also be near by offering relationship, not religion. Offer relationship, not religion. Ask yourself this question. Do people have to receive your Jesus before they receive your love? Do people have to receive your Jesus before they receive your love? My wife Kristen and I, we became very close friends with a couple who are uh, from India. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, we went to their wedding a couple of years ago. We're like, ah, why are you sending this? You know, the wedding, them weddings, we last like 15 days. Like, it's like, see, like it's, it's a big deal. Uh, if you're Indian, or so, you, you, you know I'm not lying to you. It's like a big deal. And, uh, you know, we went to this wedding and we believe that God placed us in their lives so that they have Christian representation somewhere near them. Now, understand this. I, we, with everything within us, we want them to one day accept Jesus Christ. We want them to spend eternity with us together in heaven. But we can't just expect our loved ones to inherit heaven without us being willing to invest in them in their earthly journey. Are you with me? Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30 says this. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he who wins souls is wise. You got to be wise. Listen, we can spend so much time loving other Christians to death, we miss the opportunity to love non-believers to life. We do that by being a friend. We do that by being a friend. We do that by offering to be in relationship opposed to just being in religion. And then we also do it, we, we get near by redefining the win. Redefine the win. What do you mean, pastor? Are you planting or are you watering? That's how you redefine the wind. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 8 says this. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters, you have one purpose. You got one job. They will each be rewarded according to their own labor. In other words, it's not your responsibility to convert people. Somebody missed that. It is not your responsibility to convert people. You can, but understand, some plant, some water, God gives the increase. Let me give you an example. I have a friend who's an uber evangelist. I know it's not a word, it should be. He is an uber evangelist. And this uber evangelist um, doesn't have to drive, but he does. And he goes to interesting places in the city where he knows people may be drunk or they're gonna need rides or whatever. And he picks up a client, gets him in the car, and then he puts on the song, this is how we do it, in the car. Starts driving them and he'll ask them, have you ever heard this song before? Of course they've heard that song before. <laughs> and then he starts a conversation. He just starts talking with them and he'll say, hey, have you ever heard of Montel Jordan? Hey, you know, he's a pastor at my church now. Did you know that he gave his life to Jesus? Did you know he's speaking? Did you know blah, 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 blah. And listen, all he's doing is he's sharing and these people find this interest. All he's, he's loving people to Jesus by sharing and witnessing what he's seen, what he's heard, and what he's experienced. Listen, he could be planting a seed that someone else is going to water later. He could be watering a seed that someone else had already planted. My platform is the stage. His platform is an Uber. Where's your platform? Where's your place of influence? Because when you know your platform, that's how you can redefine your win. Can I tell you what a win is? Being a friend to somebody, that's a win. Forming a relationship, that's a win. Knowing someone's story, that's a win. Giving somebody a good experience with a Christian, that's a win. Uh, uh, having someone over to your home or sharing a meal, that is a win. Praying for someone is a win. Praying with someone, it's a win. And every one of us, every one of us, we can do that. It doesn't take just pastor to do it. Like, it doesn't just take your leaders. Every one of us, we can all do that. And listen, when you do that, some are planting, some are watering, and then you plant, you water, and then just pray that during the process, God awakens their heart to who he is, and then we trust God with the results. That's what we do. We can be reminded, we can be near, and then my last thing is we can be compassionate. Be compassionate. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 is talking about Jesus. It says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them 
because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus was compassionate way. He was compassionate, meaning he was moved to feel something. And when compassion moves you to feel something, you should be compelled to do something. Now, there's a beautiful story in the Bible. The Bible comes alive for me. I don't know. Some people think the Bible is boring. For me, those stories in the Bible come alive like crazy. And in John chapter 4, I don't have time to take you through the whole thing. It's a road map. Jesus gives us a blueprint to compassion to show us how to love people to himself. And many of you may be familiar with this story. It's the story of the woman at the well. And it's, it's about 40, 40 verses. But if you have time to look this up later, trust me, it'll come alive to you. Uh, but Jesus teaches us how to interact with people in this passage of Scripture and how to be compassionate. And the three things he shows us there is that the first thing Jesus shows us, you have to show up. Compassion requires you to show up first. Listen, Jesus was heading somewhere to do something, but it didn't stop him from reaching someone. Jesus should not have been at the well because men didn't draw water. That shouldn't have happened. That entire interaction with him and the woman. Listen, Jesus should not have even been speaking to that woman because it wasn't customary for a rabbi to be speaking with a woman. All these circumstances, listen, Jesus should not have even had the opportunity to be there at that well because Jews and Samaritans were enemies. They weren't supposed to be near each other. Now, you need you to get this. This woman who's at the well, she's an outcast. She was an outcast because while Hebrew women would, would draw water at dawn or at dusk, that woman was there alone. And the scripture says at noon, meaning she was there drawing water in the heat of the day. OK, probably because she was trying to avoid being ridiculed. And yet Jesus engages this woman in conversation and he shows us that when you are compassionate, meaning when you feel something for someone, you're OK getting a little messy. Jesus, Jesus did not meet her at the synagogue. He didn't meet her at the tabernacle. He didn't meet her at the temple. He didn't meet her at church. God came and met her right where she was. He showed up. You need to show up. The second way to be compassionate is to tell the truth in love. Tell the truth in love. Can I tell you something? Showing compassion doesn't mean compromising the truth. I'll say that again. Showing compassion doesn't mean compromising the truth. See, the world, the world uh, desires us for just to just love everybody regardless of the truth. No, don't do that. Jesus gave her the truth in love. It is possible to show compassion to people of different beliefs, different faiths, different lifestyles without being permissive and without compromise. Listen, this is when I'm reading that, that scripture. Here's how that interaction between Jesus and this woman, how it sounds to me. Jesus and this woman are at the well. And Jesus is like, excuse me, give me a drink. And she's like, uh, sir, who are you to ask me for a drink? And uh, he's like, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for a drink. Because you wouldn't be thirsty no more. And she was like, excuse me, but this well right here, this well right here is deep. And you don't have anything to draw from it. And he's like, I know, boo. That's not the well I'm talking about. Jesus says, I'm telling you what I've seen, what I've heard, and what I've experienced. And there's another source where you will never thirst again. And she's like, oh, okay. Is that like vitamin water, like Pellegrino? Because I'm tired of coming here. I don't want to be thirsty no more. What is that water? Right? I promise you that's how I hear the Bible. That's, that's, how, it, that's how it talks to me. Now, the story picks up in verse 16, and Jesus is now about to give her what she's asking for. John chapter 4, verses 16 through 19. Jesus told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. And she's like, sir, I can see you are a prophet. And I need you to get this. That scripture does not suggest that this woman was a widow. 
It does not suggest that her husband's passed away. It doesn't suggest that she killed him. It doesn't suggest any of that. It does, however, present the idea that this woman at the well was continuously thirsty for relationship in places where she would never be satisfied. Help me, Lord. I feel like I'm talking to somebody. I'm in your life right now. And still, Jesus says, I am here and I'm willing to get messy. I'm willing to be a part of your story. Some of what they said about that woman was probably lies. A lot of what they said about that woman was probably true. I have a friend, Ricardo Sanchez. He says, the enemy knows your name and calls you by your sin, but God knows your sin and he calls you by your name. God is calling you. He's calling you by your name today. You all, he's calling you by your name today. And he's saying, you are my son. You are my daughter. Aren't you glad that we have a God who's not afraid to get a little messy when it comes to helping his kids find their way back home? Glory. Jesus told her the truth. He told her the truth in love, Pastor. And then he reveals himself to her. Listen, some can plant, some can water, but we don't have the power to save anybody. Did you get that? We can't say, listen, you don't have the power to save anybody. That takes the pressure off you. I can't reveal Jesus to anyone. You can't reveal, Jesus reveals himself to us. All we're doing is planting and watering and letting God do what he does. And he's doing that to some of you right now in this room. As we're planting and watering, God is revealing himself to some of you right now online. He's revealing himself to you. God's love is crazy like that. It doesn't make sense. And just like he said to that woman, I am he. He's saying that to you today. I am he. I'm almost done. Watch what happens when Jesus reveals himself to her. John chapter 4, verses 28 through 30. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and she said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. This woman did what God is challenging you to do today and every day from now on. What is that? Will you tell what you've seen, what you've heard, and what you've experienced? Your story matters. John chapter 4 verses 39 through 42. Here's the result. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So the Samaritans came to him. They urged him to stay with them. He stayed two days and because of his words many more became believers. Now watch this. This is so good. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Wouldn't that be the most beautiful thing in the world that your ears could ever hear? Like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you've seen and for what you've heard and for what you've experienced. But now I know for myself that Jesus is the savior of the world. Show up, tell them the truth in love, and then just recognize that we are called to love our neighbors as ourselves. And this requires us, it challenges us to engage with people as though our own salvation depended on it. We got to tell it, listen, you got to share what you know, because if you don't, that's not loving your neighbor. Here's what I want you to leave here with today. I'm just giving you, this is a recap. This is how you love people to Jesus. You be reminded. Being reminded means remember what God's done in your life. Remember what he delivered you from. Remember how he sees you. Remember who you represent. The second point was to be near. Being near means uh, being close to people by being a friend. Choosing relationship over religion. Redefining the win. What is that? Having coffee with someone. Being a safe place for someone's story. The last point was be compassionate, meaning show up. Share the truth in love and then love your neighbor as yourself. Not loving anyone is not loving yourself. I want to close with this right here. It's Matthew chapter 5. Y'all be patient with me. I'm almost done. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. If I could have some keys if somewhere, if you just want to play the keyboards, like keyboards make everything feel more holy to me. I don't know what that is, but it just does. If anybody could do that. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 says this. You are the salt of the earth. 
It's a simple phrase. You are the salt of the earth. Way. Be salt. Be salt. I don't know if you know this. Every other seasoning on earth adds flavor to something. Salt is the only seasoning that brings out the flavor of what's already inside of what you are seasoning. Be the one who brings out the goodness and the God that's inside of people. Can I tell you one more thing about salt? Salt makes you thirsty. When you show up in people's lives, do they get more thirsty for Jesus? I need you to be the salt of the earth. It's very simple. If you don't remember anything else I said, be salt. S. Start a conversation. A. Ask a question. It's just like what Jesus said. Can, can I have a drink? Or, hey, can I pray for you today? Would you like to go to coffee? Start a conversation. Ask a question. L. Listen. Listen. Did you know sometimes the best way you can love someone is just to shut up and listen? And then the T. Tell what you've seen, what you've heard, and what you've experienced. This is what Jesus did for that woman at the well back then. It's what he's doing for us here today. That's the message. And now, I just want to take the liberty. I just want to take a moment. Can I tell you what I've seen, what I've heard, and what I've experienced? I've seen a man who was broken and lost and prideful and on his way to hell. I saw that. I lived that. But I heard, I heard that if you would believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ was the raised from the dead that you would be saved that's what I heard and what I experienced is they didn't lie when they said that because I was a dead man I was a Lazarus and God came and raised me from the dead and he is raising some of you today from the dead. There are dry bones right in this very moment that are coming alive right now. You don't even know what to do with yourself because you can feel the power of God doing something in you right in this very moment. That's what I've seen. That's what I've heard. That's what I've experienced. That's my witness to you. And now that I've witnessed to you, I just get to give you an opportunity I may have been planting, I may have been watering, but God does the increase. And right now, he may be revealing himself to you right in this very moment, in this room, watching online. He could be doing that for you right now. And let me, know, let, me let you know how you know it's you, if he's doing that. And we're gonna, we're gonna do this. It's, this is all. I love that God does this. I, I love that God would send a 90s R&B singer into your church in San Bernardino. He loves you that much. You have great pastor. You have wonderful leadership. He, he would send me here to deliver this message to you today. He'd love you that much. And here's what it is. It's very simply this. I've told you what I've seen, what I've heard, and what I've experienced. And now here's what I want you to know. If today, if today was your last day, I don't need you to hear me now. Please hear the Holy Spirit. If today was your last day and you were to take your last breath here on earth and you wake up on the other side of eternity, a good, kind, loving, gracious God, a father, he's going to be there to greet you. He's going to say, I love you. 
I miss you. Welcome home. If you took your last breath today and you were to wake up on the other side of eternity, a good, kind, gracious, loving God, a father, he's going to greet you. And he's going to say, I love you. But I don't know you. If you don't know that God is going to greet you like that and you're not sure if he's going to greet you like this, Holy Spirit is talking to you right now. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes all over this building, watching online. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. God, you told us this doesn't take a whole lot. This is, this is simple. You have spoken. Holy Spirit is here right now. You're revealing yourself to that son and that daughter that has not fully received you as Lord and Savior. It's the greatest decision I've ever made in my life. And now I get to tell what I've seen, what I've heard, and what I've experienced so that someone else can taste and see that the Lord is good. And you're revealing yourself right now. And so I just want to say, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that is you and you have never completely surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, today is your day day. Today is your day. I don't want you to wait. I don't want you to think about it. This is your moment. If this is you, this is between you and God. All heads are bowed. All eyes are closed. Make this breath count. If that's you and you know that the Lord is speaking to you, I'm going to ask you to be courageous and stand up right where you are. If that's you, if that's you, and thank you, sis. I see you. If that's you, thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. If that's you, stand right where you are. Come on. Come on, somebody. I'm going to ask you, Hear me. One more step of faith. Trust me. Nobody's going to harm you. We don't want anything from you. We want to give you something. Will you come to the altar? Will you just come right down here so we can pray with you, so we can recognize, we can love on you? This is your, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sis. Thank you. That's right. Walk, roll, crawl, do whatever you got. If this is your moment, we'll wait for you. Come on. Come on. If this is your moment, don't play with this. If this is your moment, don't play with this. I see you, sis. I see you. Come on, we only got a couple more moments. Thank you, bro. Thank you. God is speaking to you. God is speaking to you. Step out on faith, man. Step out on faith, even if you can't see it. Even if you can't see it, come on, step out in faith. This is your moment. This is between you and God. It's between you and God. Come on, church. It's between you and God. Can you celebrate with those that are coming? Let me say this. Let me say this. As you're coming, let me say this. Maybe you have received Jesus before. Maybe you've received him before. But maybe right now your life is so entangled in sin, you feel like you're so far away from God that he would never welcome you back. I want you to know that's a lie. That's a lie from the enemy. He is ready to receive you back right now. If that is you and you have received Jesus before and you want to make things right with him today, you want to take that question mark off your salvation, you want it to be an exclamation point, we will wait for you. There's room at the altar if that's you. Listen, don't be ashamed. This, God, Jesus said, if you will not be ashamed to own me before man, I will not be ashamed to own you before my Father who is in heaven. If that's you, come on. I'm not going to pull for you. I'm not going to, if you know, yes, right. You know if it's you. You know if it's you. Don't play with this thing. You know if it's you. I see you, sis. Come on. Families coming. It's you. Come on, if it's you, if it's you, you want to be right. No question marks today. No question marks today. No question marks today. You want to know without a shadow of a doubt. We're putting exclamation marks on our faith today. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your courage. I'm so proud of you. Bro, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm so proud of you. I'm proud of you. 
My sisters, I'm proud of you. I'm so proud. God is proud of you. We're going to say a prayer. I, I'm, I don't want to linger. I, I, hate do, I hate doing that. Somebody, see, why are you wrestling? Why are you doing that? Come on, why, why, are you, why are you doing that? God's talking to you. God is talking to you. He's not going to call out your name in here. He, you know it's you. If it's you, this is your time. This is your moment. We're going to say a prayer. Come on. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Raised to life. I'm proud of you. Come on. Come on. <laughs> 